It is Christmas Sunday. I am so glad that you're here. And I have some important information that I would like to begin with. Things that you need to know. When four of Santa's elves got sick, the training elves did not produce toys as fast as the regular ones. And Santa began to feel the pre-Christmas pressure. Then Mrs. Claus told Santa that her mother was coming to visit, which stressed him out even more. When he went to check on the reindeer, he found that three of them were giving birth, and two others had jumped the fence and were off frolicking who knows where. Then when Santa began to load the sleigh, one of the floorboards cracked and his bag fell out on the ground, toys scattered everywhere. So a frustrated Santa went to the house for a cup of apple cider with a shot of scotch. When he went to the cupboard, he discovered the elves had drunk all but a few drops of the cider, and the scotch was completely gone. In his frustration, Santa dropped the jug, which shattered into a thousand pieces on the kitchen floor. He went to get the broom and found that the mice had eaten the straw at the end of the broom. Just then the doorbell rang, and an irritated Santa marched to the door and yanked it open. There stood a little angel with a great big Christmas tree. The angel said very cheerfully, Merry Christmas, Santa. Isn't it a lovely day? I have a beautiful tree for you. Where would you like me to stick it? <laughs> Thus began the tradition of a little angel atop the Christmas tree. Is much ado about Christmas. The operative word here is ado. Not a word we often use. It comes from Middle English, and I have information for you about it. Synonyms for the word ado are dizziness, bustle, flurry of activity, confusion, upset, excitement, hubbub, noise, turmoil. Ado suggests a great deal of fuss, clamor, commotion, excitement, and noise, and implies considerable emotional upset. That's beginning to sound a lot like Christmas, isn't it? What do you think that is? That it's, Barbara talked about this last week brilliantly, about the idea of the most wonderful time of the year. is the time when <coughs> crisis occurs, and you get into fusses and, and arguments and differences of opinion, and nothing seems quite right, and the judgment level just skyrockets. Why is that? Well, I have a theory. I have a theory is it, in that we teach our children the same way probably you were taught, is to make a list of what you want. The entire idea of a secular Christmas, I'm going to start off there, is about what do you want? Are you going to get it? Are you good enough to get it? Which creates tension. And then everything about Christmas is around meeting expectations. And we all get stuck in that thing, that going around in circles trying to make something work to meet other people's expectations. That never works. And from that point of view, we end up frustrated, confused, out of alignment, and we just wish it would all be over so we can get back to our normal lives. And this is all personally imposed upon us. We do this to ourselves. And what happens when we do it to ourselves? There you go. <laughs> we have, and then you go to the religious side of this. Here's, here's a, and if you leave, I leave him up for a while because I'm still there. On the religious side of this, this is the, uh, the holiday of inconsistencies and misunderstandings. In that, Everybody tries to make this thing fit, and it's interesting that, that uh, uh, the, the basis of it comes from the book of Luke, which is where the Christmas story is written. When I was a kid, I didn't like all this wanting that was going on, so I imposed my own desires upon my siblings and made them sit quietly before they could open any presents and listen to me tell the Christmas story from Luke. Yeah, how'd that work out? Yeah. <laughs> This is how the story begins. 
And it came to pass on those days that there went out a decree from August Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Did you know that the Romans kept excellent records of what they did in their society? There is no record of that taxation, of that decree. That's made up stuff. That's made up. Somebody did that to make a point. I don't need to get into why. But it is interesting that it took the better part of four centuries for Constantine the Great to say that the Roman Empire would now be Christian. We don't really know why he said that, other than his mother was kind of fancy and interested in this Christian idea. So what happened was, it became the law of the land. Now we live in a country that, that has, holds this high standard of separation of church and state, right? Religion and, and the government are separate, right? Except that it's closed on Christmas. It is the only religious holiday that the, that the government closes on. And if you want to check it out, go over to the West Asheville transfer station where you drop off your waste. They will probably tell you they are open every, every uh, day of the week, including Saturday. They're not open on Sunday, but uh, uh, Monday to Saturday, every single week, every day, no matter what, except Christmas Day. They will not take your trash on Christmas Day. Other than that, that's what they do. Isn't that amazing? So apparently that idea of separation isn't complete. Now, nobody complains about getting off the day for Christmas. That's good. I'm not complaining. I'm just pointing out that there's a bit of inconsistency that goes on with this. And, and that when we live in a state of inconsistency, we get an inconsistent response. So what do we do with this? What do we do with the, the incongruency of, of a holiday like this, where we don't all agree as to what it is and where it came from? In fact, you could say that it's the only holiday that we really don't know exactly what happened. We don't know when it happened. We're not even sure why it happened. That there's so much mythology around it that it just seems to grow in some areas and diminish in others. But we all take the day off. And we focus on this idea of, of giving. So perhaps it's the idea of giving that we all agree on is the best part of why we do this thing called Christmas. Giving. What is our giving? Well, it, it seems to me there's really two things that we give, that we can give from, from our culture, from the way we experience it in our teaching, in our metaphysical new thought perspective. There's two things that we can very clearly give. One is we're going to do in this room on Christmas Eve, this beautiful Christmas Eve service that we do. And we call it, um, we call it sharing the light. And when we do it, what we do is we have this, we have fire on the stage, and we have our fire, uh, our, our candle, our light bearers come up and take the, the fire from a single flame and offer it to the room. And every time that it's offered, there's a phrase that said, the Christ in me honors the Christ in you. So what does the word Christ mean? It's a Greek word. It actually means anointed one. It's all, it also is synonymous <coughs> with Messiah. Can we all claim to be the Messiah? Yes, we can. Because we are the only ones that can save our lives. We are the only ones that can save our lives. So, to take nothing away from the life of Jesus of Nazareth, I assume a brilliant teacher, based on the things that were said about him and written about him, 80 to 100 years after he lived. Nonetheless, some great stuff came out of that. Yet it still becomes our responsibility for the outcome of our lives. That is our general teaching. Is that we cannot rely on anyone else to save us from the situations we create in our own lives. It's our job. So the idea of honoring the Christ in another is to say, you've got what it takes. You've got everything that you need. You are the anointed one. You are the savior of your life. You can make this work. And to say it from the place of knowing, and so can I. What a powerful thing to say. What a powerful thing to know. The Christ in me, that anointed being that I am, that powerful, creative, spiritual essence that I am, sees that in you too. Wow. What greater gift can anyone give to anyone? That's it, right there. So, I leave you with that idea. And if you can be with us 
on, uh, on Tuesday night? Wonderful. Please come. This room is going to be beautiful. It's going to be an elegant experience, and there's going to be a lot of love. If you can't be here, find somebody in your life to say that to. And explain to them what it means. So that you can see that in their eyes. An awakening, a quickening, a fullness, a richness. Because the divine dwells at the point of them as much as you. And sometimes when you can see it in them, it helps you know it in yourself. That's what we need to know. So that's the first way that I think we can be incredibly generous. And then we go off on this, this uh, gift-giving thing. Barbara and I stopped years ago giving each other gifts of sort. Yeah, we're just going to go to the beach. Yeah. Uh, but we, we don't like go out and buy presents for one another. And it has taken an incredible amount of stress out of our lives. Yet, you know, I do love to make fudge, so anybody who comes here on Tuesday night is going to have a, a shot at some of my fudge. And uh, um, that's, that's fun, and we do buy for our grandchildren because they are the ones with the lists. <laughs> Pray for them. <laughs> Sometimes their list includes model numbers. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's all perfect, you know, everybody's finding their way. So, okay, I want to look at this idea of, of this gift. The second uh, idea is this idea of being generous in our giving, but it's not the gift. It's not just the gift. Ernest Holmes spoke so eloquently of this. I want to share his ideas on Christmas. Christmas is for remembrance, he says. The love manifesting through our gifts to each other typifies the offering of life, the givingness of spirit to itself. The hands of the eternal are outstretched through our hands and the heart of the infinite beats in the human breast. But the giver must give her or himself for the gift without the giver is bare. It is not then in lavish gifts that we find true giving, but in the sweet simpl simplicity of remembrance, in the kindly thought, the tolerant mind of the gentle act. Love alone can give love, and only goodness can really do or be good. The one who gives for reward does not give at all. He seeks to bargain, to trade for spiritual gifts. Hence, he senses loss in his own giving and finds no completion through the act. But the one who gives half of their meat to the hungry feel justified and are warmed by the real sense of connection. It is through this creative act that we establish unity between ourselves and others. Great causes succeed when there is a giving of humanity. With every check that is written must come the one who wrote it, demonstrating their interest, enthusiasm, and love. The check must be a symbol of a desire to impart oneself. Then shall it multiply its benefits and do good. Charity can be cold, cold but love is always warm. When heart speaks to heart, a divine conversation takes place. A heavenly discourse ensues. Each of us has something extraordinary to give. Let us always give our best. When we bring our gifts to the altar of love, let nothing less than the best be acceptable to us. Let nothing less than our divine nature be enough. May the real spirit of Christmas, the giving of ourselves, to life, enter and abide in us now and through all time. Ernest Holmes. Yeah, is that good? We can see this probably better than anybody because we're not in this moment attaching it to any anything outside of ourselves. From the place of us, we can create a Christmas experience that is extraordinary. It matches what Michelle and Diana shared with us today. That idea of a full, rich life no matter what. It does not matter what the details of your life are. If you choose to experience that Christmas spirit and that generous nature for the next few days, you're not only going to change the life of anyone you share it with, but you'll change your life in a powerful and meaningful way. The focus is, how can I be that great a giver? How can I give to life more fully than I have before? 
how can I step up this idea of what I bring to the world? It can be simple. It doesn't have to be on the evening news. If you know it, then it's something worth knowing. If you can feel the difference, then you've made a change in the world. There's a, an old story. I think, it, I think it comes out of uh, uh, the uh, uh, soup for the chicken soup for the soul. Was where I first heard it. It's a, it's a simple story uh, about a guy, uh, and the story's name is Paul. And, and Paul has a wonderful relationship with a wealthy brother. And the brother, for Christmas, gives him a new car. He loves his new car. He parked it right up in front of where he works. And on Christmas Eve, as he's leaving his, his uh, uh, office, he comes out, and there's this little scampy kid walking around in a car looking at it. Just looking at this brand new car. And the guy, Paul's thinking, this is trouble. He said, what are you doing? He said, hey, mister, is this a new car? He said, yes, it is. My brother just bought that for me. Wow. And you didn't pay anything for this car? Not a dime. It was a gift to me. Wow, I wish, said the little boy. And he stopped and hesitated for a moment. Well, Paul's going to say, I wish I had a brother like that. But that's not what the kid said. He said, I wish, I wish I was a brother like that. Yeah, I wish I was a brother like that. He said, you want to go for a ride? Yeah. So the kid jumped in the car, and Paul got in, started it up, started driving around. And the kid was just kind of looking around, checking it all out on the inside. He said, hey, mister, could you, could you ride by my house? Paul says, of course. He's figuring he wants to show off this fancy car to his friends, the people that live in his neighborhood. He was wrong again. They pull up in front of his house. The boy points it out. says, that one right there. They pull up in front of the house. He jumps out. He's up right back. He's gone for a few minutes. He comes back. He's carrying his little brother who can't walk. He says, he hears him say to his brother, see, buddy, it's just like I told you. It's a brand new car. And that man, he got it for free. Someday I'm going to buy you a car just like this so you can go out and see all the beautiful things out in the world that I keep telling you. Opened Paul wide up. Of course, he got out of the car and went around, picked up the little boy. And they both jumped into the car where they put him in the car, and they all got in. They went on a lovely ride. I tell you what. If it's true that Jesus said that it is that it is more uh, precious, more sacred to give than to receive, that's a perfect example. So I ask you, how in your life can you see yourself as that elegant giver? doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Sometimes just a promise, just a wish, just a desire, spoken aloud, can make all the difference in someone's life. Find your way this Christmas. It's Christmas time. Let's use it well. Merry Christmas. I love you all so much. Thank you.